everybody to the Pennsylvania Horticultural Society's virtual workshop for beginning gardeners as part of the Harvest 2020 program. And today we are talking about soil. And since we took a week off last week, I hope you took some time and were nice to one another um, over the last week. Um, we were supposed to talk about compost last year, uh, last year, last week. And so we're going to talk about that as part of the soils um, information because they're so closely bound. I am going to talk about dirt. I'm going to give you the dirt on dirt. And this is my favorite workshop of all of the workshops anywhere because I get to get my hands really dirty and I get to talk about eating and pooping. My favorite thing because I'm a grandma now. So let's talk about the... Uh, the basics of what soil is made up of. This is the famous Philadelphia clay. Clay is a major component of the soil in our area. I'm just gonna show you all these things and then I'm gonna talk about how they um, work all together. Um, this is some compost that I scraped off my steps. It made this compost all on its own with no help from anybody. I've got some uh, mulch. I've got some worm compost. I've got some gravel. And oh, in here I have some sand. And over here I have some really, really it's a good thing we don't have smell vision because this is some really, really rank garbage. All right, so what makes up the soil, especially the soil of Philadelphia and Pennsylvania? Well, Philadelphia's soil, Philadelphia's natural soil is practically non-existent because there's hardly anything anywhere in the city that we haven't dug and removed and built and covered and uncovered and covered and uncovered and covered. So the soil of Philadelphia is pretty much an archeological dig. But if you can find some real soil, what you're gonna find is this clay, which is, um, it's the color is deceptive because it's on an orange. Um, generally the clay around here is pretty pink. Um, clay is very, 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 very fine fine, fine particles. The problem with clay is the articles are so fine that when you wet it, well, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna wet it. Um, when you wet it and you rub it, it's like slimy because the pieces are so small that they're very smoothly will rub over your hands. It is full of minerals. It's full of iron and magnesium and, and um, all of the, minerals that a plant needs, but the problem is that the particles are so very fine and so very teeny that they stick together like glue. And the roots of the plant have a hard time getting in between them. So especially when it rains, we get um, all of these particles stuck together and then the rain dry, then when it dries, what do you get? You get clay, um, like baked clay. This is the same kind of stuff that they make pottery out of. I mean, this is some serious clay here. So what we need to do, although all the chemistry is in there, the minerals are all in there, what we need to do is to loosen that stuff up. We need to get more organic matter in here. And that's what all of these other things are, except for the stones. The stones are fairly obviously stones, and I forget why I have them, but we'll, we'll come back to them, I think. Mm -hmm. So. What I want to talk about is how do we get the organic matter integrated in with the clay so that we get the minerals of the clay and then the living biology, the biology of all of the critters that are in the compost, how do we get them together so that we've got the chemistry on one hand, the biology on the other side, we put them together and that's where the magic happens. So to talk about that, we have to talk about eating and pooping. So let's take a step backward. Before the clay happened, 
the whole world was made up of bigger pieces. So, I mean, you can see these, you don't have to zoom in. I got pebbles in my hands and these came from much larger rocks, but these are wonderfully round because they've been over millions of years have been worn down by the action of water and wind and freezing and thawing and water and wind and freezing and thawing. So that as larger pieces um, crack because they're being worn away, water can get into the cracks. And then when water freezes and thaws, what happens? We know what happens. Um, when water freezes, it expands. So the water gets in there, it freezes, it pops um, bigger cracks into the large pieces and they become smaller pieces. So eventually by erosion, wind and water and wind and water and wind and water, and also sometimes internal pressures from the middle of the earth, um, these pieces become much smaller and they turn into sand and clay and everything in between. So that's how we get the basis of our soil. Now the way that the organic matter works is pretty much a similar physical structure, but it, um, instead of the physical wearing down of the particles, it's more a biological wearing down of the particles. So what that means is you've got this big tree and the tree falls dead and the little critters, first the big animals bite pieces of it and the little animals bite pieces of it and they're biting these pieces and they're eating these pieces and they're pooping these pieces. So the large pieces become smaller pieces. You also have wind and water working on them. Um, but mainly it's these critters eating and then they poop and then somebody eats their poop and poops it out even smaller. So you've got this constant chain of eating and pooping and eating and pooping and eating and pooping until you finally get really fine, fine particles that still have all of the nutrients that were in the big pieces, but they're now in a much smaller form and they are much more available to the roots of the plants. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take you on a little journey with my worm compost. Do I want to do that first? Sure. Um, I have, let's just talk about compost in general. This is my household garbage. You saw this before. It's kind of recognizable. That's collard greens, broccoli flowers, eggshells, corn husks, all of this stuff banana peels, all of this stuff is what I introduce into my household compost. Now, um, with the composting, I could do two different processes, but mainly I'm, um, I'm very lazy and uh, I have a household that I can't demand a whole lot of. So I, I mean, I love them all, but I'm not gonna make them very carefully deal with the compost. So what I've done is I've set up a compost bin outside of my door and when you are done with your garbage you just go and dump it in. And then periodically somebody introduces some dry leaves to it. So I'm taking my big chunks and I'm letting the natural process of rot and, and munching break this down into smaller pieces. Now this one is very passive and all I do is add uh, carbon to it, and we'll talk about that later, the nitrogen and carbon that we combine to make um, your compost be a balanced product. Um, I, we dump our garbage, we cover it with leaves, we dump our garbage, we cover it with leaves. Some earthworms have come and made themselves at home there. A lot of pill bugs and a lot of other bugs have made themselves at home. They're all part of the natural process, which is why it goes on outside instead of in the basement. And Eventually, over the course of a year, uh, the stuff at the top is, is filtering down and I can dig stuff out at the bottom and it will be soil. So what I have dug out, where is my dug out? This is the gross, disgusting crap from the top. This is what I have dug out from the bottom. And um, I'm not gonna make, Stanley come up and look at that. You can see that this looks a lot different than this. We've got garbage in big chunks and now we've got compost in small pieces. And what I can do is add this directly to my clay 
And the proportions when you're starting a new garden is if you've got clay or topsoil, which is questionable um, what it is, um, because when you buy topsoil, it just means soil that they scraped off the last construction site. And um, so you wanna make sure that you get a topsoil mix, which means the clay and, and abysmal thing that we call soil in Philadelphia is to proportion 30 to 70. So I've got 30% topsoil, 70% compost. And I'm really happy with this compost because it doesn't have any big recognizable pieces of wood chips or wood or garbage or anything in it. So um, the most common form of compost that we're able to get when we're buying soil from a garden center is mushroom compost. Word about mushroom compost. We are in the absolute best place in the world to get compost because we're close to the mushroom houses. Mushroom houses, are, the mushroom compost is um, what is left when they grow mushrooms. They grow mushrooms mostly on hay and manure and some other things, but when the mushrooms have eaten all of the stuff and digested it and rotted down, whatever is left is really shot from guns compost called mushroom mushroom soil or mushroom compost so when you order soil from a garden center what you want to do is you want to have a mix of if you can get 30 70 we have most of the garden centers around here trained and landscapers are trained and that is um that is the preferred gardener mix especially if you're building raised beds um if you can't get that then something called a contractor mix which is 50 50 but you want more compost if you can get it than you want topsoil because this is where all the nutrients and organic matter that are feeding your tiny little um, root hairs on your plants there's a whole marketplace going on on a microscopic basis where the tiny little root hairs are down there the plants are making sugar the roots have the sugar and they will exchange it with the little um, micro critters, what let's call them. They're fungi and bacteria, some viruses, some really, sm really small insects and nematodes. They are on an almost microscopic level exchanging sugar for the nutrients that they need. So all of that's going on under the ground in the roots of the, of the plants under the soil. So we want to make our critters happy so that they in turn are making our root hairs happy so that the root hairs are pulling the right nutrients out of the soil and that's what's making our plants grow. So what can we do to make sure that this happens? Well, I wanna talk about um, making our own compost or bringing in compost and different ways that we can, um, we can get that mixed properly into our soil. Now, if you are working in clay, then you know that that stuff is really hard to dig. It's very heavy. And it's also um, hard to manage when it's been raining because the ground is, um, everything is sticking together. And when you step on the soil, you are compressing what little bit of air is already in there between those particles. Your, your size nines are making it so very difficult for plants to get their roots through. So what we want to do is we want to find ways to integrate this into this. I mean, you could stand there and just do this all day and that will give you, um, but generally what, um, what people like to do the first time they garden is add a whole lot of compost, whether they've made their own compost, whether they've collected it, from their yards where leaves have fallen and they leaves have broken down and incorporate that into their soil. The first time um, you do a garden, people, people really like to plow or rototill. Uh, I'm not um, a big fan of that year after year, but that first year it's handy to not have to turn everything by hand. So what you're doing is you're trying to get a nice mix and get it blended happily. A rototiller does that real well. Um, but you can also do that with, with a shovel. So if, you're, if you, however, like many of us, are building um, raised beds because you don't want to have to deal with the archaeological dig that is our soil, then what you're doing is you're raising up your soil and bringing it in 
and mixing it right in the bed, which is very easy to do. Um, when you first start out, you want to do this 30, 70 mix. And if you can get it already mixed before you get it, yes, do that. But if you have to mix it yourself, then just remember, do your stretches first, do your stretches afterward, and make sure you got a nice big glass of water because um, it's a lot of work. But if you do the 30, 70 mix the first year, what that means is that the compost, you've got this much and this much, let's just say. What's going to happen over the, the year is that this compost is going to get eaten and it's going to be, um, it, it's going to decrease in size so that by the end, of, by next year, they're going to be almost equal in volume, where last year it was 30 and 70, now it's kind of 50. So what you want to do each year is you want to keep adding more compost. You don't really need to add more topsoil because you've got enough minerals in there, probably last you a good, I don't know, five, 10 years. Um, you need to just keep adding the compost. Um, if you find that adding the compost, it starts to get worn out after a few years, then throw in some more topsoil to get more of the minerals. Um, I mean, we've joked, we've called it, uh, we've talked about having a, a soil of the month club so that you are borrowing, are getting, you're trading so that you've used up all of your something, you've used up all your iron and you get some topsoil from somebody else and add it. It's in the old days, it was called remineralization. And I think in the new days, it's also called remineralization, but um, that's a little off track. But what we want to do is we want to keep adding compost each year. So do I want, if I'm planting perennials in my garden or things that I want to have there from year to year, do I want to keep rototilling the soil? No, I don't want to do that. So how do I incorporate my compost or my organic matter into my bed? Well, there are a couple different ways. It's easy to do. Um, you can add, every time you dig to plant a new plant, you add some old compost and it's old compost. You don't want fresh compost that's still, um, that you can still recognize the garbage in because that's gonna spend too much time rotting down. It's, it's gonna be too self-involved to actually feed your plants. So you want old compost. So that's from the bottom of the compost pile. And you wanna add your compost. You can add it as you dig. So if you are digging out your row to plant, then adding compost. Um, if you're just digging out holes, then you add your compost. And as you're replanting halfway through the season and you replace a plant, train coming. You add more compost. Um, and you also are adding compost as, um, as a top dress. By a top dress, I don't mean you're wearing it all over the top half of your body. What I mean is a top dress is you have your plants in a row and then you're adding compost around them as a mulch because that's going to continue to the the micro critters and the big fat ones the big worms are going to be pulling it down into the soil where it's going to do your plants the most good um, a trick that i have learned in community gardens is um, a, a lot of our gardens are set up with raised beds and the path between so what do you do about the path between you don't want to be walking in mud um, and so if you can get wood chips, because wood chips seem to be another natural resource for Philadelphia, if you can get wood chips, generally by following the sound of a chainsaw, which we're not listening to right now from Ninth Street, um, you can get wood chips dumped fairly cheaply or even free um, near you. We put wood chips down in the paths between our beds in the spring or in the summer, then by the end of the year, what has happened both by us walking on it is breaking it down and the critters that are inside of it are chomping and breaking it down. It's turning from chunks of wood into beautiful compost underneath. So what we do in, uh, in the community garden I'm involved in is we rake off the big pieces and then we dig out the wood chips and we put them into the bed because they have become a well-rotted source of organic matter. So we've taken the tree, um, the tree's trash, um, which would go, could, would go to landfill if we weren't using it. And we're using it to beautify the garden and to keep from walking in mud. And over time it breaks down and we use it to add um, organic matter into our beds. And then we replace it with more wood chips. 
So that's a really easy way to get, um, to get it in. Um, do you need to buy compost? Probably, the first year, it's not, it's not a bad idea if you can afford it and if you can find it to get compost. But what I have not mentioned at all is the recycling center in Fairmount Park, which is, I mean, we complain about the city um, a lot. We all do. Um, but this is one thing that they do really well. They collect those wood chips. They collect the manure from the police stables. They take garbage from the different city-owned um, um, restaurants and consignments, and they mix it in a really, re they do a really good job of turning it into, um, turning it from garbage and wood chips and poop into beautiful soil for our gardens. So can you get that? Right now, I believe it is free. And, um, but, and we can, uh, you can go to the city, just, um, just do a web search for uh, Fairmount Park uh, Organic uh, or Recycling Center and they'll take you there. But I think the deal this month still is if you make an appointment because they are still contactless dealing with, um, they're not making deliveries, but if you have an open back truck, you can make an appointment on a Tuesday or a Thursday uh, and the directions are on the website. You can go there with an open back truck and they will dump it in the truck for you. If you are in a van or a car or something, instead of going to the recycling center and getting it dumped in your, in your, in your back, you go to the, um, the Horticultural Center, which is nearby. It's where the greenhouses are, where the um, Japanese house is. You go there and wait in line in the parking lot and because they have the same organic matter in piles all over the parking lot. And you can go and not have to be face to face with anyone. Of course, they require masks um, for anybody coming onto the facility. But you can go from pile to pile as you're directed and fill your own buckets and take it away for free. So um, I highly recommend that you take advantage of this quickly because generally they charge for this and it's a lot more difficult um, to get. So to so go get it, get it. Um, if you are collecting, I, I mean, I have, you can see, this is not a virtual background. This is my real yard. And I have a lot of um, pine trees and a lot of um, tr trashy trees that drop a lot of leaves. And um, what I do is as I rake the yard, in the fall, um, I save the leaves, and um, I I will save the leaves. I stack them up, and I mean I save the bags, and uh, um, I cover my fig tree with them in the winter. It insulates my tree. Um, I collect the leaves, and I run them over with the lawnmower. It chops them into really small places, and then I put that right in my flower beds, right in my vegetable beds. Um, anything that I'm raking up. I put right into my beds as a mulch. And then, especially over the winter, it breaks down and continues to feed. And then in the spring, um, I, I plant in directly in it and then try to find some other uh, forms of um, organic matter as, as a source. Um, if Miss Ruth is out there, I want you to know, Ruth, they give away this stuff free on the street in the fall. They, they, people pack it in bags and give it to you. It's amazing. So go get some. Um, what else do I need to talk about? Um, Cassidy, are you watching the chat? Are there any urgent questions that must be answered? Uh, Marianne is asking yeah. if you have to make an appointment to pick up compost at the Hort Center, and I believe right now you do. Right now um, you do, because it's only open on, um, and it's, it's um, I think it is info at fpc.org. No, I will. I'll, I'll find uh, the link and I'll put it, put it in. The she chat. is a wonderful person. She's going to find that out and let us know. But yes, you do need to make an appointment um, on and it's only open on Tuesdays and Thursdays because I believe the other days they have more people standing by at the um, at the horticultural center to help people out with the um, with picking up the from the from the different piles. So what I wanted to show was something that it, oh, I wanted to show my worm bin. Um, all of this is, this is just stuff from all over my yard. 
And you can't see up, uh, uh, up close, it would be easier to see, or if I could throw it to you, you would. So but we're looking forward to next year when you can actually come and play with my, with my dirt. But um, I have, I am sad to say, when I went out to try to find some horrible clay, as an example, in my yard, I was not able to find any because uh, there is so much organic matter in my, in my yard from me being here and compulsively feeding it for the last 15 years, going on 16, um, that sadly I was not able to find clay and I had to go and, and get it from somebody else. Sad but true. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask Stanley to bring our camera over and we're going to look in the compost, in the worm bit. Um, before, while we're getting to that point, the difference between regular composting and worm composting. Regular compost is um, a more passive process. Um, we're adding nitrogen, we're adding carbon, we're adding nitrogen, that's the garbage, we're adding carbon, that's the dead leaves, nitrogen and carbon, and in order to hurry things up, we stir it up and add more water. I mean, more air, it gets more air in and that gets the little critters munching and munching and munching and eating and pooping and breaking it down much faster. But even if you do nothing it, and sit there in a year, it will break down from garbage to soil. Um, you can get, if you are really enthusiastic about watching what you put in it, you can get compost done in maybe six weeks, usable compost, but it itself is a much more passive process. What we're gonna look at now, we're gonna peek into my worm bin. And hey, in my worm worms. bin, I have very special worms. They are not earthworms, they are night night crawlers. They are red wrigglers. Um, sometimes they're called garbage worms. Okay, now can you, we're gonna look down into, the, into this garbage here. All right, okay, this is my worm bin. And um, you can tell we had a picnic the other night because there's my, my, uh, my corn, and here's my, oh, okay. So I have put garbage in here and I just dumped the garbage in and covered it up. And here are my worms going to town. Can you see them? Okay, can you see these worms now? Yes. yes. They are going to town and they are eating my garbage very furiously. And uh, what they do is they eat the garbage and they, of course, you get a lot of worm poop. And that is what turns into not a compost, but more of a soil, all, more of a fertilizer. So this is much more potent than what is in um, regular passive compost because these guys are um, these guys are shot from guns. They are really going to town on this. Um, what do I feed my worms? I feed my worms um, anything except onions and uh, citrus peels. I don't feed them any dairy. I don't feed them any meat, but other than that, they pretty much eat what we don't eat. And they have been turning this into um, a really, really, really potent. So what I do, and there's another whole workshop coming up on worm bins, but this stuff, without the worms, I just put into um, my watering can, stick a handful in my watering can, shake it up and water right onto the plants. And this is a very, very, very strong fertilizer. I would not plant directly in this because it will burn the roots of your plants. Okay, now, oh, now, <laughs> um, what do they not eat? <laughs> you can see, when I, when I sift this, I find that they don't, they won't eat the, um, the whole corn husk, they'll go in and out of that over time. Oh my goodness, they are all the way in there. They found their way into the inside of the corn husk. This is an avocado. They don't eat, they eat the inside, but they won't eat the husk of the avocado. It's amusing to find out what they don't eat. They also don't like plastic. They don't like the stickers on the bananas. The worms that you add to a worm bin, the red wrigglers, eat amazingly fast and amazingly large amounts of garbage. Do earthworms and the worms that, um, the night crawlers and the ones that you find in your yard, do they eat the garbage fast? No, 
And if you put them in your uh, worm bin and, um, and try to feed them garbage, you will have a fetid, horrible, stinky mess in very short order. So you wanna make sure you have the right worms and you have the right amount of everything. Um, and I believe, Cassidy, there is a worm composting workshop coming up. There is, I had to double check to see if I was muted or not. Okay. Uh, there is a workshop, I will link it so that people can register. And there is a whole lot of information available about worm composting, both on the um, um, on the Harvest 2020 site and um, out there on YouTube. There is so much stuff about worm composting. So if you are using a regular compost bin, I, my compost bin is up against my house. The nearest soil is about 10 to 15 feet, depending on which direction you're walking. And the worms have managed to find their, them, their way over the 10 to 15 feet of concrete and get into my compost bin. So if you wanna add some um, to your compost bin, then go right ahead. But if you don't, they will find their way there in short order. Um, one of the suggestions that I make uh, it, it, while we're asking about adding things to the compost is uh, when I'm making my own compost bin, I like to get um, a bucket full of compost from somebody else that has um, a, uh, a good compost bin moving um, because it will have all of the right mix of um, the micro critters and um, probably will have some, or some worms in there as well. Can you see the mosquitoes buzzing around my head? I am just so sweet today. All right, is it possible to put too much compost on? And um, if so, would you notice if you did? Um, considering the fact that you can practically grow stuff in compost short term, um, I think that it's, I would like to say that it's hard to put too much compost. Um, if you did that, what would you notice if you did? You would probably notice a nitrogen deficiency, which means that you would have not, your stuff wouldn't be as green as you like. It would start to be more faded. Um, so um, it will be hard, but not impossible to add too much compost. And how it will show up is probably as a nit nitrogen deficiency. Um, Comment on putting compost directly in the soil. Um, okay, so this is not putting compost directly in the soil. What you're asking, what Jonathan is asking is, can he put his garbage right in the soil? Um, he has done that and um, a month later it's gone. So what you want to do if you're gonna do that is you don't wanna put it directly next to your plants but it's called sheet composting and what you can do is like bury it in the path and it will the worms will find it and it will um the problem with putting it too close to your plants is that as it breaks down what it's doing it needs nitrogen to um to help the breakdown process and if there is not enough nitrogen it will start pulling it away from plants and that will cause you to have a nitrogen deficiency so don't put the garbage too close to the plants. Also, as stuff breaks down, you might notice you get some heat. So, um, so it would burn it. It could burn it from the heat. It could burn it from, the, um, from pulling the nitrogen away. You don't want the garbage. And it also, it will stink. So you don't want the garbage right next to your plants. Put it in the paths. I have seen um, where, um, actually, I have done this in the past, uh, especially in the winter. I've taken a five-gallon bucket, cut the bottom out of, with a snap-on lid, buried it in the soil, and then I would take the lid off and I would throw my garbage into it. And I, sometimes I would throw dried leaves if I had them. If I didn't, I would just put the garbage in, put the lid back on. And when the bucket was filled almost to the level of the soil, I would pull the bucket out bury the garbage that's in it and then dig another hole and move the bucket so that I am constantly enriching the soil as I move along um, without having to to bury the garbage each side each side do you okay Katie asks do we need to be a, um, a Philadelphia resident to get compost from Fairmount Park you're supposed to be yes um, 
and they they usually ask you for to show ID or show a piece of mail to to, to demonstrate that you are a resident of Philadelphia. Um, I don't know if they're doing that these days because they don't want to get close to you. So um, you may they may ask you to post your address. Uh, I mean, they have this whole procedure where you put your um, a sign in your window to say what it is that you want and where you're from. So make sure that your address says that you're from Philadelphia. Um, can you pick up compost at the Meadowbrook location? I'm not sure where that is. Um, I know that there's one in Cheltenham off uh, behind Mount Supplicker Cemetery. There's a big um, compost pickup place. I don't know what their rules are during the, the COVID shutdown, but we've gone to yellow, so it probably will be easier. Uh, I know there's also one in the Tookany Creek area. So, um, and again, I don't know their rules this week. So, um, so do your do your homework. Um, if if miraculously um, somebody adds that to knows the answer and adds that to the chat, um, then everybody will have it. So if you know that answer, please post it. Um, from Jonathan, for brown matter, is it okay to use newspaper? or brown paper bags from Trader Joe's or paper. Oh yes, all of that stuff. What you don't want to use for brown matter, um, the smaller the pieces, the faster the critters can eat it. So if you're talking about brown matter in your compost or in your worm bin, um, shredded is best. Ripped up fine is, is good. Um, you don't want to use the shiny, um, the glossy colored, flyers that come out on Thursdays on your doorstep. And through all of this crisis, miraculously, I'm still getting my flyers delivered on Thursdays. Uh, the circulars, don't use those, but egg boxes are fantastic. Worms love them. Um, if you're adding these to your regular compost, they will break down, but they break down slower. Um, Marianne says, we don't see the bin. Oh, well, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, are there pro tips on best practices for starting seedlings? Um, the best practices for starting seedlings, um, I don't use compost for seedlings. I use a soilless mix or a, you know, a, a potting mix because if you're starting seeds indoors, you want to be as sterile as possible. When you're doing compost, that is exactly the opposite of sterile, but you want it that way outside. You don't want it that way if you're starting seeds indoors. Um, does it give the plants a, an easier chance? Yes, if you're worried about them getting a fungus. Um, at, when they're teeny tiny, you know, that, that fungus that comes and it pinches the stem and then the whole thing flops over. It's called damping off. It's a very sad event when your seeds have that. Um, but best practices for that, I say use a soilless mix or a sterile soil. Um, what's a super easy low maintenance way to start composting? I live in an apartment with access to a small outdoor deck. Um, I, um, I would go with a worm compost. I would not try to do um, active composting. I would do a closed system. Uh, not airtight. A worm bin is not airtight, but it is a closed system um, so that you can control the, um, but you're doing it on an outdoor deck. You can do anything you want on an outdoor deck. It's just that um, the best compost bins are um, when what you want to do to get critical mass so that you get internal heat rather than passive breaking down. Um, if is you need to have a bin that is at least three feet by three feet by three feet um, so that you get enough um, internal volume that th it can actually heat up um, and kill any, um, uh, any of the harmful weed seeds, especially, is what you want to have it kill. Um, it's hard to do that on a small outdoor deck. So I would say go with a, a, worm, a worm bin. And you can buy fancy dancy ones. They're really some really cute ones. And they're very, um, they're very organized. Mine is not organized. Mine is, uh, is a big, you know, Rubbermaid bin that I got from the hardware store. And, um, but I'm very happy with mine. It lives in the basement in the summer, in the winter, when it's really, really cold. And then I bring it out once it's, um, once it is no longer going to get to be 20. It can live outside below freezing, but it doesn't want to be down in the 20s. Um, did we find out, Cassie, did we find out when the worm bin workshop is? 
The worm bin workshop is on, oh, the one that um, Gardener Engagement is doing? Uh-huh. I don't believe that one is on the website, but we are doing one about composting July 20th. Okay, so we're going to do, we're going to build and tear apart um, and we're going to deconstruct and construct a compost bin um, at that, in that July workshop. Um, I thought there was a specific worm bin workshop. If there's not, well, then what we need to do is schedule one. Um, but meanwhile, all that information is, is available out there. Um, where do you get or buy worms? Well, if you can get worms from somebody else, that's a wonderful thing because free is always good. Um, I have posted on Craigslist. I have gotten them on Craigslist and I've given them on Craigslist. Um, if you are trying to start a brand new system and you're uh, not adverse to paying money for them, Uncle Jim's Worm Farm is my favorite place um, because they always have sales and they always, the worms always come um, exactly when they say they're going to and they are generally in good shape and they have lots of other products um, related to that. Um, do they kick back? No but I, I love them. So I'm giving a shout out to Uncle Jim's. This is what compost, compost does its own thing. And compost will compost even if you are not even trying. So um, the fun thing was I cleaned down, I have steps that go down to the street. And generally um, you say I got a lot of ivy and a lot of, um, a lot of vegetation. So it falls, it rots, it falls, it rots, it falls, it rots. So I'm cleaning the steps and in the corners of the steps, I'm cleaning out the corner of the steps and there is a chunk of compost and, and a night crawler that is no lie, eight inches long. Um, somehow happily living in that one corner, all curled up, just eating all of the, uh, um, uh, of the, the compost that nature sends its way. So I was very impressed with that. Did I get a picture? No. Okay, does your worm bin have to be kept indoors? Um, I keep my, like I said, they don't like 20 degrees. They will stand freezing if they're not, uh, in, if they're in a large bin. If they're in a little teeny bin, I keep that in the house all the time. Um, just because uh, with a small bin, there's no, not a lot of margin for error. Um, here's the link for uh, phila.gov services, Get Organic Matters. Um, if I put broken leaves on my vegetable garden at the end of the season, do I have to till the garden in the spring? No. Um, I am trying to, I am, I am getting more and more and more intrigued and, um, the, by the whole no-till. Uh, I have had a rototiller. I have used a rototiller in years past. And what I found was, um, from years of using the rototiller over and over in the same space, what happened was directly below where the rototiller gets to, I developed a hard pan. That means that since the soil down there is, is never, um, it's never churned, it's never, it develops like a, a shelf that, um, and the water doesn't go any deeper than that. So that's, a, that's a, um, something that you need to consider if you're tilling over and over and over every year. It's much more effective if you use the, um, the power of the worms and the power of the roots of the plants to bring the nutrients down, to break up the hard parts and to make the soil softer. When I put my broken leaves in the vegetable garden in the, in the fall, what I do is I just dig the holes that I'm gonna, um, I'm going to put plant in. I don't turn over the whole garden anymore. Um, I've got enough organic matter in my soil that I can actually break the soil up with my hands, which is why my fingernails look like, um, like they do. But um, broken leaves are a wonderful thing. Um, I have gotten broken leaves by tromping on the, on the, um, on the bags that they're in. And I've also gotten broken leaves from, um, from running them over with the lawnmower. Should I use anything special for transplanting cuttings? Um, I would, and that's a different, um, a different subject altogether. So I would not use, if I'm using, if I'm transplanting cuttings of houseplants, um, I would probably use a sterile soil 
for that because I'm trying to encourage um, a lot of new growth and no rot. So, um, so use it if you're transplanting cuttings, then that I would go with that. Um, if you're transplanting things outside where you're, you know, taking a, something and sticking it in the ground and hope it roots, just um, I water with a little bit of worm, um, worm compost whenever I plant anything, whether it's transplanted or planted um, or cuttings or, or rooted things. Okay, I am really glad Kelly, Kelly asked about um, the clay in Philadelphia having a lot of lead and I cannot believe that I forgot about talking about lead. So, um, Okay, wait a minute. We're, we're about to cross the. All right, here. Uh, never mind. Um, he walked right past the camera. Um, let's talk about lead for a minute. Lead is a byproduct of the whole world, and especially before the seven in this before the late seventies, um, lead was a very large portion of um, of gasoline, and so car exhaust had a lot of of lead in it. So uh, soils that are near highways still have a lot of lead in them. Um, so what do we do about taking lead out of our soil? Or what do we do about testing for lead? Um, if we're in Philadelphia, oh, the other place that lead comes from um, is from leaded paint. So if you are gardening where there used to be a house, there is often a lot of lead in the soil just from paint chips, from um, having worn off the house, houses over hundreds of years. So, um, and I live in a neighborhood where we have the big old porches and all of them got painted after the war and the Navy gave out all this battleship paint that's like 30% lead. So we, got, we know about the lead issue. Um, do you need to test for lead? Well, you can test for lead and um, we'll come back to that in a second. Um, or you can just assume that lead is there and, um, and act accordingly. Lead is an issue in your soil if you have um, acid soil that makes lead more, more available to your plants. Um, how do you counter uh, acid soil? Well, with compost. Um, if lead is in the clay soil, um, how do you counteract that? Well, you add compost because compost is mainly cellulose and cellulose is carbon and carbon is what they make filters out of and charcoal filters and all of that stuff because what it does is it binds the heavy metals and they become less available to the plants. Um, is your plant taking up lead out of the soil and putting it in the fruit a problem? That is much less of a problem than the dust. So if you've got leaded soil and dust um, gets on the leaves of the plants or gets on the, um, on the, on the plants themselves that you're going to be eating, um, then you've got a problem. How do you counteract dust? You mulch. So the answer to all of this is adding more organic matter into your soil, onto your soil, um, and in your pathways so that you're not creating, and digging less, so that you're not creating dust. So can you test? Um, yes, absolutely. Um, Penn State has a soil test kit, um, but you have to pay a lot of extra to get it to test for soil. Uh, University of Massachusetts has um, a low cost soil test for lead. I think it's 10 bucks. Back to this lead situation for a minute. Um, if you are concerned about lead in your soil because you've done your homework um, um, and you find that yeah, the lead, lead levels in your, um, in your area are high, then first you don't eat root crops because they're laying in the dirt. It's better chance that you're going to get lead dust on those plants. So um, your first choice should not be root crops. If you decide to grow root crops anyway, make sure that you peel them before you scrub, scrub them and peel them before you eat them. Okay, your second choice is the wrinkly leafy things. 
um, like spinach, where a lot of dust is going to get caught in the crevices of your plant. So you, if you had the choice between root crops, leaf crops, and fruiting crops, then go with the fruiting crops. Um, that's the zucchinis and the tomatoes and the peppers and that stuff. Because by the time the plants get the lead from the soil up the plant to the fruit, you're good. Um, so, but with, as with everything, as with everything we do, we wash, we wash everything. How many worms do I have in my bin? Okay, when I bought my worms, I bought five pounds of worms. So that's, um, it's not just five pounds of worms that came in compost. So the weight of it was a little, uh, a little less worms and a little more compost. But um, that was enough for my 30 gallon bin and another 30 gallon bin and then 10 five gallon bins. So uh, I would say you need about a pound of worms. Um, it's However, if you're looking at it and it costs the same amount for five pounds as it costs for one pound, then get the five pounds and give them to your friends as gifts because who doesn't want worms as a gift? Um, where can I find a list of resources for outside of Philadelphia? Well, you would find that outside of Philadelphia. Um, do I know where compost is available? Um, no, but that's a, that's a, um, I would go to specifically your municipality and see if they do composting. Um, and if not, um, this is why the, they invented the internet. Um, I don't know of any outside of Philadelphia, except for the one in Cheltenham, um, which is just over the line from Philadelphia. Okay. Um, Cassidy says, when I started my worm bin, I had maybe five to 50 to 100 worms, but the worms will populate the site, the, the bin. Um, yes, this is true. Um, that's a really good way of putting it. They hit their carrying capacity, so you don't need to start with a, a ton of worms. But if you want, um, I, I mean, I, it, it's hard to buy less than a, a, a pound of worms. So um, unless you're getting them from a friend, um, I would start with a pound. But Cassidy is absolutely right. They will, they will reproduce and um, they will, you just have to be careful to balance things. You don't give them too much food until you get a lot of worms. Rutgers also tests soil, yes, but I don't know that Rutgers tests for lead for $10. So that's why we go with the Amherst um, uh, University of Massachusetts uh, test because it is, um, it's a much more reasonable price. How do you make soil more acidic for plants that prefer that? Um, easiest way is to, um, it's hard to do that with compost because com compost, even compost that's heavy in, uh, in uh, coffee grounds tends to be more neutral and more uh, alkaline. Um, so to make soil more acidic, a um, couple different things that you can do. Uh, one is, uh, move to a place that has a lot of pine trees and evergreen trees because their needles drop and they do tend to acidify the soil over time. They break down very slowly, but they do break it down, a breakdown. Um, other people I know, you can get fertilizer that says that it's, um, it's for acid loving plants. Um, I know that uh, I'm not, not a, not a, uh, uh, a fan of miracle Grow, but I know miracle Grow has something called mere acid for blueberries. Um, and uh, you can get other other stuff. Um, people get sulfur and add sulfur, um, but my suggestion is to ask at your local garden center because they know that stuff, and now most of them are open. A miracle happened. So um, pine needles, acid fertilizers, um, I was about to say, so, oh, oh, Espoma carries an organic uh, soil acidifier. Thank you. Thank you. That's an organic um, or organic um, uh, fertilizer. Um, what other people have done, I know I was surprised to find, uh, I've always assumed that urine was acid. And I was surprised to find as an adult that urine is alkaline. And um, so, when you have, say, a tree or a shrub that is uh, on the sidewalk and dogs like to pee on it a lot, um, I was thinking that it was, uh, it became more, um, 
more uh, more acid. And what I found was exactly the opposite. And so the recommendation was to with um, uh, to water with a tablespoon of vinegar in um, in a gallon of water, and to do that every couple of months um, until you start to see. Um, the soil returning to more of a, uh, of a neutral. Um, have I done this? No, but I'm guessing that if you put a spoonful of vinegar in a gallon of water and you watered your, um, your azaleas or your, um, or your blueberries or whatever it was you were trying to acidify the soil for, go with that. Um, do which plants, vegetables, fruit prefer acid versus neutral compost? Most compost is, is neutral to alkaline. So um, yes, Margaret, apple cider vinegar does, does work. And it will give you, I mean, if it's live apple cider vinegar, it also gives you a benefit of a little bit of micro critters. Um, what plants, vegetables, and fruit prefer acid versus neutral compost? Okay. Um, uh, oh, I was saying that uh, most compost is neutral to alkaline. So, um, but what I find is um, that vegetables and annual um, plants seem to prefer the, co the compost, the worm compost. Um, so worm tea, worm compost, um, because it seems to be more bacteria than fungal related and the um, the more perennial shrubs, perennials, trees uh, tend to like a more fungal compost, which is what you would get from um, from regu more from regular compost than you would get from um, did that make any sense so um, Annuals and vegetables that are one season seem to like the compost that comes from um, from the worm bins and um, the juices from the worm bins, and then the perennials um, like more of the stuff from um, compost that takes longer to break down. Why shouldn't we add garlic, onion, citrus to compost? Because the worms hate it. Um, so you don't get a nice... Um, uh, also, okay, um, if you know that in days of old, garlic and onion and citrus um, have antibiotic qualities, so they've been used as antibiotics. And, you know, you would make a poultice of, um, of onion and soak a wound in it to draw the poison out. Um, so garlic and onion, antibiotic, the worms don't appreciate that. Um, citrus tends to be very acid and burn. So hey, if you had a compost and you could get the uh, the um, the or orange and lemon peels to break, if you got them in small enough pieces that they would break down um, naturally in the, then you might get more of an acid um, acid compost. Interesting um, thought. So I'll, I'll do more research on that and keep the future to myself and never tell anyone. Um, okay, stink horn mushrooms grow in compost soil. Oh, um, that is a really interesting, if anybody has ever gotten a load of wood chips um, and you went out one day and suddenly there are all these little, little orange weenies growing up out of the soil, um, pretty amazing. By, by lunchtime, they're gone because they've rotted down and they stink. They, they get flies, um, flies tend to eat them um, because that's how they get pollinated. Um, pollinated, if you, if mushrooms re don't really get pollinated, but um, they, um, if, if the spore is in the compost, yes, they will grow. Are they harmless, uh, harmful? No, no. Do you eat them? No, um, but they're not going to hurt anything and they really do make the mushrooms grow, break down, the mushrooms really do make the wood chips break down fast. So if you're trying to use them as the wood chips as eventual compost, they're gonna break it down fast. If you're trying to use the wood chips as, um, as a pretty mulch, they're gonna break down fast and you're gonna, it, it's gonna be weird. Um, okay, what's the best ratio? I'll, I have bugs flying around my head. Um, um, what's the best ratio for brown and green? How much newspaper versus um, fruit and vegetable matter. Are we talking, Jonathan, are we talking um, about um, 
worm bin or are we talking about a regular compost bin? Um, because I find that in a compost bin, three brown to one green keeps you from getting too slimy. Um, in a worm bin, um, it's you add nitrogen and then you cover it with carbon. So you add the green, you cover it with the brown, and you watch it. And in a couple of days, if it's if it's really wet and slimy, you add more brown. So um, the worm bin is gonna be much more dynamic. The regular compost bin rule of thumb is three browns to one green. Um, that seems to work pretty well. Um, does compost have enough nitrogen? Um, it depends. Um, if you have compost and your compost is alive, so it's still got all these little critters um, breaking things down, then nitrogen isn't usually a problem. But if your compost is um, um, comes in a bag from the store, then I would I would assume that it needs that it needs more more nitrogen. Um, adding leaves and worms to your soil. Do you have to test the soil it, yeah, every year now? No, because what is in the leaves and worms and stuff is kind of irrelevant to the baseline of your soil test. And what you're testing is what are the minerals that are in, um, except for phosphorus. Phosphorus gets added um, with the leaves and worms. You need to test the soil every year. Um, if you are a really organized person, it does not hurt to have your soil tested every year. Um, um, but if things are going well, I don't, I haven't, uh, I, I, the, what I test, have tested for in the past is more lead um, to see where I can garden with vegetables and where I should avoid. Um, so um, as far as nutrients, I add compost and, um, and I watch, and I watch to see. How does one care for a fig tree over winter? All right, here's my, um, here's my trick. I um, I took advantage of the gift of leaves that was provided in my neighborhood. Um, people keep putting out bags of leaves thinking that they're going to get collected um, by the city and get composted, and they don't if they're in a bag. I mean, if they're in a, pa in, in a paper bag and you've got specific word that they're going to get collected um, and composted, then... Um, a wonderful thing but generally people put out bags especially plastic bags of leaves in the fall thinking that they're going to get picked up and used as compost and they go directly to landfill and they do not and it gets totally wasted so i um i run around and i collect all my neighbor's leaves especially the ones that are in smaller bags and clear so i can see there's no dead squirrels and trash in them like because that never happened um I take my bags and I pile them um, around my fig tree and that becomes my, they're dry and, uh, and they're, they're pretty much sealed. So they're not getting wet and weighing things down. They don't weigh a lot. So they're like, I'm packing pillows of insulation around my fig tree. And I leave that on until I start to see green leaves in the spring. And then I take them off and I use them in my compost. So I've stored them. They've been useful in their storage um, as an insulator for my fig tree. And then I take them away and use them. Um, I can either use them as mulch or I can crush them a little more and put them in my compost as my source of, of, uh, of car carbon. Um, so that's generally what I do with my fig tree. I used to do all of the stuff of laying it down and burying it. And it's like, and I finally broke down and I bought varieties that are hardy to this region. So I'm growing Chicago figs. They're a smaller fig than the brown turkey that people traditionally have grown around here, but they consistently come back year after year and get figs the, every, every year. Uh, whereas the brown turkeys, they, they're so finicky. One, one year I had a 20 foot tree and I had more figs than I could give away. And the year after that, it died back down to the ground and it has never gotten that tall since. And it's been 10 years. So get a variety that you like, 
insulate it with bags of free bags of uh, of soil. Okay. Um, do you cover vegetable beds at the end of the season? Um, I, as much as I can, I do a whole lot of work on my vegetable beds at the end of the season in the fall because I then will plant stuff um, either in the fall to have it come up in the spring or I will um, have my soil with lots of compost and broken leaves and all of that stuff, I will pile that on my beds so that in the spring, all I have to do is just move the stuff away and plant right in it without having to till. And it is, um, it gives me, it means, especially in the raised beds, it means I can start planting in February. That, that first week, you know, that week of like the 23rd of February, it's my birthday, so I always remember. When we're outside in t-shirts, we sent the kids to school in shorts, um, and, uh, we're, uh, and we're able to plant uh, because we don't have to dig soil, so we don't have to deal with mud. So um, every season, we add topsoil and compost to our raised beds until our tomato plants lower leaves are turning yellow and dying off is this a soil issue um it could be a soil issue but it's more uh, if only the lower leaves are turning yellow and dying off um i would guess every season you're adding topsoil and compost it's easier to just add compost um but If you're concerned that it's a nutrient, then get your soil tested um, and do it in the fall before you add stuff in the spring. Do it in the fall. Um, if your lower leaves are turning yellow and dying off and it's not working its way up the plant, because that's a different thing. That's not a nutrient thing. That is a um, generally a fungus thing. And uh, it means that there's a fungus that came in on your plants or is present in your soil. And then every time it rains, it bounces up onto the lowest leaves and then those leaves die off. If it's working its way up the, the plant, then it could be a fungus disease. And what you need to do is rotate your soil if that's at all possible, rotate your plants so you're not growing um, in that exact same space. Excuse me. Um, in the exact same space uh, with the same crop. I just, of course, sprayed my screen. That wasn't good. Um, or water with comp with a uh, water tape. Um, plastic bags of leaves around my fig tree. Um, could you do the same with camellias? Probably. Um, I don't crush the plants. Um, um, I mean, I don't jam, I just, it's loose and it's piled. Um, uh, camellias are a little bit more delicate than, um, than figs, um, but they're, yes, you can do, uh, you have my permission to do the same thing and then let us know next year how it worked out. I think it will be fine. Um, will my blackberry bush need acidic compost or neutral? Blackberries don't care. They, um, they grow wild in, in, um, in Pennsylvania. Uh, clay soil is generally a little more... Actually, you know, our soils are, are fairly neutral here in Philadelphia. I'm up in East Oak Lane where, um, where the soils are really acid, and I haven't figured that out yet, except to say that it must be because of all of the evergreen trees. Um, so do you need new stuff, um, need acidic compost? Compost, compost, compost is, is fine. Um, although, you know, it's funny, blackberries are much tastier when they're growing in desperate soil than when they're growing in happy soil, but they're bigger and juicier when they're in happy soil. So you make, you know, you make your choices there. Is there value to adding compost? This is another question that just came in. So we won't, aren't, weren't told to leave. Um, is there value to adding compost under a shade tree when I'm only growing azaleas? Do they seem to be doing okay? If they're not, don't worry about them. But if you've got compost, it's not gonna hurt them. Um, please say again about coffee grounds. Okay, um, my neighbor brings them to me. She is a Starbucks 
fanatic and she was so happy when they reopened and she brought me this big bag of because they save the the, the grounds a lot of coffee places will save the grounds and give them to you for a compost bin um, coffee is slightly acid but when the coffee grounds break down they break down fairly neutral but um, if that's what you're trying to do to acidify your soil, then you really don't need to compost them first. You would side dress with them. You would just take a handful of coffee grounds and shake it around the, um, the drip line of your plant. Drip line, that's a new, nice uh, a new word for some of us. What that means is that if, it, if your plant is this big and it rains on the plant, Wherever the outside edge of where it drips, that's the drip line. So you would sprinkle around the drip line um, um, with coffee grounds. And that will um, help to acidify your soil. Don't pour your coffee. No, especially if you have like milk and sugar in it, it's not good. Um, but regular coffee is, is um, a fine thing in small doses um, to wake your plants up. Um, okay, we got another sign off. So I'm guessing that um, we're going to give it one more minute to get all your questions out there if we didn't answer them. Um, otherwise, Cassidy, we're going to turn on everybody's mic so we can, um, we can all say hello, goodbye. Thanks, everybody. Be nice to, be nice to everybody. Grow enough to share. Um, and then don't forget to share it, um, but be safe. Be safe and be healthy out there, everybody. Love you all. <laughs>